Rods are cigar-shaped objects that are anywhere from 12 inches in length up to 100 or more feet in length. They travel at extremely high velocities, barely visible with the naked eye unless you know what they look like, because they must be traveling at hundreds of miles per hour. And these objects, at first we thought, you know, we thought they were uh, aircraft of some kind or insects, you know. I, I got a fax earlier today from Arizona, from MUFON in Arizona. Uh -huh. And they said what you think are rods are insects. Okay. Going in, I was already under the microscope as far as scrutiny is concerned. You know the way it is, one bug in the works and it's all over your credibility is down the tube. <laughs> one bug. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had to make sure, and we, we started filming at one ten thousand shutter speed, where when an insect flies by directly close to the camera, or a few feet away, or even a little farther distance, or a bird. Um, at one ten thousand frames per second, you can distinguish what an insect is. When you go frame by frame, you get one single frame that's a very clear image of an insect, whether it's real close to the camera, whether it's far away, and whether it travels fast. At that same shutter speed, when a rod passes by, it is a rod. It'd be great I, if they I, got, I got mixed up the other day. I saw that. Boy, really. I just saw a big rod go in front of the lens. We're going to go out with a team of scientists to all the sites because now we have 19 states where we know it's verifiable that these objects are appearing in broad daylight on a daily basis. 1996 comes along and there's some people diving into the same cave in Mexico. And this time we have a rod object with a base jumper that's falling in. And um, this was taken with high broadcast quality, you know, uh, videotape, beta right. SP cameras. Um, you can see it going into the shadows of the cave with most of its torso covered by the shadow where part of the tail section is still in sunlight. And I've had uh, Bruce McAbee seen this. I've had Dr. Jack Kasher. We've had entomologists, zoologists, biologists, paleobiologists, you name it. <laughs> They're saying this thing is definitely not a craft. It must be some kind of a species, but we've never seen anything like this at all. up here to Lakewood, Colorado, where I live, and, and I was very skeptical at the beginning. I said, well, you know, I want to see what he's talking about. So I sat, I literally just sat over his shoulder and watched the early footage. And granted, the early footage was mainly what he and his wife Karen had shot when they were down in Midway, New Mexico. And at that point, you know, I was just looking over his shoulder and just saying, you know, well, you know, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. But there were just a few shots that just gave me, you know, now that was something that I can't explain. And we started to build on that kind of a relationship of, okay, I see what you're seeing here, I see what you're saying there. And it was, it was a lot of an education process for me. And a lot of it had to deal with the speed of these objects because what we were dealing with actually up until just recently were just a few frames here and there. They were so fleeting and so fast that mm -hmm. we would sit there and look over each other's shoulders and it was like, did you see that? No. And then he would say it to me, did you see that? And I'd say no. And we'd have to play the tape back and review it. And that's when we really started to scrutinize what we were looking at. And, and I'm serious about the scrutinization. I mean, we started comparing with birds. I mean, we started to have, you know, a bird shot with a rod shot. We started to have a bug shot with a rod shot. And I started becoming even more intrigued at this point. It was like, okay, well, that's a bird, and that's a bug, but this is a rod. So we worked together, and I started telling Jose, I said, you know what? You know, I, I, I'm sitting here looking over your shoulder. I'm looking at this stuff, but we're not going to convince 
hardly anybody of this stuff. We need better data. At that point, Jose came up with a sky fishing protocol, and then we start getting stuff from outside sources, and then we start to see some detail into these objects, and that's when I really was intrigued at that point. I was hooked. I've been researching these rods, uh, these objects, with uh, Jose for over three years now. Obviously, rods exist. We have enough video proof of that, I believe. And I think it's time, uh, possibly with this new video, that uh, this is uh, definitely going to go down in the history books because I think we have an undiscovered life form that is living among us. Um, especially with some of the footage that's included on here on the cave. And uh, we're talking high quality digital video cameras that are, are definitely picking up something. And I think it's, uh, it's very important to scientifically go out there and research these and study them. And I think, importantly, that rods possibly are something that is just uh, among us as earthlings and, and on the earth and not necessarily coming from another planet. Obviously this video is going to prove that these are real objects and again adding to the overwhelming evidence that rods do exist and and we've only made up the term rods. I mean we they could be anything and I, I really think that uh, we need to have researchers from Mexico and researchers from Canada and researchers from the United States to kind of bring all these countries together and try and uh, figure out this mystery. Sky fishing is basically this. You set up your camera in a position and first of all, you look through the viewfinder and keep your left eye open if you're right-handed. You set your zoom on your camera to where you catch the same identical scene that you're seeing with a naked eye. This way, when you capture something, you say, well, I had the camera set at the same position that I'm seeing with a naked eye, okay? And then you tilt up the camera and let it roll for two hours. Tilt it up at 45 degrees try to keep trees and telephone poles and, you know, in the viewfinder so that you can have some kind of reference. Right. But um, that's basically it. And you set it at the highest shutter setting possible. This way, when an insect passes real close to the camera and buzzes by the lens, you will see, when you go frame by frame, an insect. Right. When a rod or other type of anomalous object passes by, it'll appear as it really is. So, you know, that's the sky fishing technique. Very uh, valuable uh, tip. Uh, how to videotape UFOs and rods. the video you will be seeing real-time video clips. This is raw, uncut footage of rods as they appear. We urge you to look carefully through the sequences and see if you can spot the rods with the naked eye. We've, we, we've got a shot with a rod coming basically over the shoulder of 
the videographer, Mark, and it pulls away from you and banks, and you get an end-on shot of it, and you can see that these appendages, fins, whatever you want to call them, are, mm -hmm. are mounted on, you know, against the side of the torso, and then it banks away from you and turns again and gives you another look, and it's all one continuous sequence. It's, it's a mind blower. When we were scanning the tape and each UFO or object had a different shape, we had to name them different names. And we came up with the rods because it looks like a microorganism, a bacteria, a virus. The rod shape looked like what I saw under the microscope. Being a medical assistant, I saw that commonly, the rod shape. So I immediately said, those are rods. They look just like on the videotape, but it seems to me they look bigger with your naked eye. And on the videos, they look smaller. It seems like they're closer. Uh, I get it more, of course, on the video, but I have seen them with the naked eye. Once you get used to it, your eyes seem to catch it better. And you see it straight in front of you instead of in your peripheral. I was on vacation with the kids to get away from it all, and I was videotaping, and I thought, well, okay, we'll aim the camera up towards the sky for just a moment. And lo and behold, a rod went over the plaza. And I saw it, and I went, hmm, on the tape so I could mark it with my voice. And that's how that happened. Hmm. After Karen and I appeared on a variety of TV shows, radio talk shows, and after the website was established, it wasn't long before we started getting footage from a variety of people across the U.S. who were independently videotaping for rods in their areas. We now have over 28 states that have rod activity.
that rods were appearing in Mexico were sent to us by Santiago Iturria of Monterrey, Mexico. He had sent us a video where he was showing most of the area around Monterrey where there's been a lot of UFO activity. It was because of Santiago's footage when we saw it in 1994 that we realized there was rod activity in other areas other than New Mexico. One thing that's as being a UFO investigator that's been basically frustrating is that you can't apply the scientific method to just the observing and documentation of UFOs in general to try to figure out what they are because you have no control over the sightings. It's basically a random event and all you can do is observe after the event has happened. The thing that, that makes the rod so interesting to me as an investigator and why I've really kind of been spending more time on investigating rods than quote unquote UFOs is that we have something here that eventually became pretty obvious was common. And, and therefore, it was like, if you're willing to spend a little bit of time, do some sky fishing, you're going to end up with some rods. Seems like almost everywhere you want to go. But now, after we found the cave in Mexico to where, for whatever reason, it's a, a habitat for them, then it was a time to get really excited because it seemed like you could just go down there and point your camera and you're going to catch rods. Now the one down in the cave looking from the top down and you've got a, a skydiver at the bottom of the cave. You can see his head and two arms. Right. And clearly uh, right there in the top middle of the frame is this uh, object. It's brilliantly lit up white by the sun. Right. And there are four what look like uh, you almost say front legs and back legs sticking out of it. You can see the upper right corner of that frame where the sunlight is shining and you can see the shadow being cast. We don't, you know, those things are what we call appendages, mm -hmm. the white uh, balls. This is the shot that we've always looked for, because now a skeptic can't say, well, that was just a bug passing by the camera lens. This thing is of some size because the camera was 40 feet away, 40 to 50 feet away from the base jumper. The side of the cave is close to about 100 feet away, so this object's got to be of some size to be able to attract that kind of shadow. Oh, you're probably looking at the jumper, it must be at least 10, 12 feet, huh? Yeah, the rod has entered a portion of the area where the cave covers most of its torso. Yeah, it's the tail. dark. Uh, I'd say 70, 80% of it is in shadow now, and just the white to end is still in the sun. Looking at the footage, that is really strange, something like that. Very, very interesting. It's a remarkable phenomenon. When you took this footage and this material and made the presentation to the scientists, what was their response? Was there an audible, what is that, or did they uh, think it over? What did they say? At first they said, well, it could be an insect, okay, because I was showing them other clips before this particular one. Then they looked at this one and they said, we don't know what, the, what in heavens, <laughs> we don't know what it is, you know. Right. They said, uh, we've seen bats, we've seen, you know, swallows, we've seen every kind of known type of object, you know, it's just, but this is definitely something that's new. And another thing we also presented to them were sounds that these things make. We have three video clips, one, uh, two from New Mexico and one from Tempe, Arizona, where these rods pass by the camera and they make a certain sound. Really? Yeah, it's like a clicking noise. One of the zoologists mentioned that it sounds like the flapping of a nighthawk, the kind of flapping it makes during mating season. An entomologist said that it sounded to him like a mating call that a cricket makes. Both of them started out a little skeptical about it, but by the end of the film they were scratching their head going, well, what in the world is that? And it went on from there. They had agreed to uh, send the film to some of their colleagues. and let them look it over and after they returned the uh, the videotapes back to Jose um, they really didn't have an explanation uh, everybody they showed it to really didn't know what to think of it from what I can tell I think that Jose Escamilla really has something here uh, he's done some good solid research shown that they're not bugs and, and eliminated other things and he's, he's making a genuine effort to figure out what this strange phenomenon is I don't know what those things are but from what I can tell, there's something that seems serious enough to warrant further research. So I really think we should get the scientific community and anybody else that, that would like to get involved seriously investigating these things.
Here is another real-time video clip featuring footage of a base jumper and rods in the cave in Mexico. professional videographer who was filming uh, one of the weapons for the uh, Swedish Army, which was a type of tank, rapid-firing tank, kind of similar to a larger caliber Bradley fighting vehicle that we have. Right. And um, this thing fires off eight rounds in about three seconds, <clears throat> and the shell casings are uh, uh, shot out of the top of the turret, and the shell casings are still arcing through the air. They haven't even touched the ground yet, and a rod comes zipping through <laughs> and, and, and again in about uh, four or five frames completely from one side to the other and those shell casings are just suspended in the air and they hardly move at all just to give you, a, you know, an idea uh, like I said they obviously have to be traveling at least 100 miles an hour or so Because there were slight differences from one image to the next, there were some differences regarding these uh, appendages, is what I used to call them originally. And at first they struck me as being maybe like little wings, pairs of wings running along the length of the body. But that didn't work because they weren't always in opposing pairs. Uh, you know, sometimes you'd have four along one side of the body and three along the other. And then some people maybe suggested that these were actually maybe little uh, globes of energy along the side, but that didn't really jive with me because the thing looked organic, it looked alive. So I was trying to think of, of what was something consistent, you know, that would carry on through all the different rods that we were seeing over a period of years. When you started looking at Brian Williams' shot, you could really make out that this was a, a single membrane or a continuous fin. We look at the rods, the rods themselves with their body don't undulate like a fish, but instead their body's relatively stiff and their fins do the undulating. And the first thing that came to my mind as far as like a, a model what I was picturing, and I recognized a fish I'd seen a long time before, and it's called a black ghost knife fish. The scientific name for the fish is Apternotus albifrons. It's native to the Amazon basin. Its main means of propulsion is an anal fin, which is the fin that runs along the bottom of the body, from right behind the head where the gill slits are, almost all the way to the very tip of its tail. And it keeps its body stiff. So instead of undulating its body to swim like a fish normally does, it keeps it fairly rigid, and it just uses the undulations of this very well-developed anal fin that goes from one length to the other. Just as easily as they move forward, they can move backwards. With my fish, it's given me a chance to watch this undulatory fin in action. To have an image in my head and, and, and holding, being able to observe all these hours and hours of rods, you know, from the very first shot, and like I said, and have it all in my head and try to con you know, convey it out there, and then with your computer animation, you're able just to show it exactly, you know, what I was thinking. And to have it work like that for you then to be able to plug it in and run it right alongside actual rod footage and show how it works. I mean, that's great. In my mind, I knew that it would work. It was just how did you, you know, how do you convey that? How do you show it to somebody? Anybody can render something on a computer, but now we do have a model that if somebody wants to go out there and recreate an actual rod shot and add realism, now they have a model that demonstrates their flight. At least we've proven that this is the way they seem to fly.
have you been investigating Roz Jose? Since 1994, March 19th, 1994. Let me tell you, Jose has stood uh, in front of some pretty ugly fire from people who haven't really looked at the issue for what it really is. We had to stay ahead of skeptics with what they would be claiming we were filming. First of all, we ruled out the planet Venus. This was not the planet Venus, you know, zipping by the camera. Then we ruled out lens flares, okay? We shot purposely towards the sun with the sun shining in where we get a lens flare across the lens and these objects would still zip through the viewpoint of the camera. So we ruled out that these were not traveling lens flares. We ruled out jets, we ruled out birds, and the most common misconception that a lot of the skeptics and critics that were saying that we were filming were misfilmed insects. So we did all these tests and we came up with a protocol that we call sky fishing, and no matter what goes in front of the camera, real close to the lens or a short distance or far away, when you go frame by frame and you investigate what might have passed by, you will distinguish whether it's an insect, a bird, or one of these rods. At that protocol, there's no mistaking it. Right. Now, there are a lot of people who have tried this uh, technique. It involves taking a camcorder, setting it on a tripod, going usually outside uh, a building. Uh, of course, the sun is screened away from the camera lens by the building overhang, but you're shooting up into a bright sky to get full illumination without the sun. And then you go back inside and look at it basically uh, frame by frame. When you shoot into the sun, it's real important that you shoot at the high shutter setting this way, at the highest shutter setting, you will get definitive structure of whatever passes by. You right. will be able to tell insects, debris that's up in the sky, and rods that fly by. Recently, John Bro, Tim Edwards, Frank Serra, Brian Williams, and many other people that are using this technique have been under fire by ufologists and skeptics. And I'd like to defend them on this technique because one of the outstanding things about shooting into the sun is that you can see the undulatory wave fins of these objects. We're going to start focusing on this technique. real-time video clip was provided to us by Brian Williams from his huge archive taken over New Jersey. I think step by step we can build computer models like Jose is doing and just keep working on it to try to make some progress in it because we really have something here that, that warrants our attention. By continuing to compare the model with certain rod shots, 
we are beginning to get more and more matches as to how they might fly. This rod appears to be banking, and as you can see it travel, the inside fins appear to be static where the others are undulating. The following real-time video clip features the base jumper that is barely missed by a rod, and then later on as you look at the footage, you are going to see one of the best shots taken of a rod in that cave. Nice layout. No matter what. This next sequence features the base jumper, swallows, insects, and rods all within the same sequence. Some amazing footage taken uh, actually looking down into a cave that goes straight down uh, into the ground. This is a, a bigger than a cave, it looks giant. It's like this massive opening that goes straight down on the earth. And how deep is it, Jose? It's approximately 1,600 feet deep and it's a linear cave. And the cave is 165 feet in diameter. And it's narrow at the top and it expands as it goes down to the base. It's just an I mean, just on its own, it's just an extraordinary geological feature. Inside the cave, it's inhabited by swallows. They call them golondrinas. The name of the cave is Sotano de las Golondrinas, which means uh, cave of the swallows. And these things emerge every morning. They come out early in the morning, like bats do. You know, bats come out at night, you <laughs> right, know, do their right. deal. Well, the swallows come out in the morning, they go and hunt, and they come back at dusk. The very first footage we saw of this cave even preceding the current footage we had, was of a jumper who actually jumped off the skids of a helicopter back in 1990. <laughs> and it was the first subterranean parachute jump. Yeah. You can imagine that concept. In the meantime, it gets some fame, and base jumpers have been jumping off of it, and that's where we got the current footage we're dealing with. And I've got to tell you, the cameraman that filmed the latest footage, uh, his name is Mark Lickley, you know, I'm hollering rods and UFOs, and he goes, yeah, right. But uh, two weeks later, he finally, you know, starts reviewing the footage, and he sees this rod. When Jose first contacted me about the footage that had aired on real TV, I thought, well, this guy's, uh, this guy's out there. I thought, well, you know, what he's seen was simply a distorted version of a bird, uh, because there are, there are millions of these birds uh, in the cave in Mexico. I thought for sure that's what he's seen. Uh, weeks later, when I had gone ahead and had some time and reviewed the tape that he mentioned, uh, I, I was totally blown away. I thought, wow, what have I, what have I captured here? Uh, the first thing you think, okay, it's got to be a bird, and quickly that's, that's not what it is. Then you think, okay, it's an insect flying close to the lens. Uh, even if that's what it is, it's, it's unlike any insect that I have ever seen. Uh, whatever this creature is, it, it is a new species of something, something undiscovered, how long it's been around, I don't know. It's incredibly fast. Uh, I've never seen one with my with human eye. I've only caught them as blurs on my uh, my camera. And when you do it in slow motion, you it is decipherable enough to say that's not a bird, that's not a, an insect like anything else we've ever seen. Uh, you you are definitely definitely uh, set back in your seat, and you say, well, what what the heck is this? And you actually become thirsty about you know. How can we get a better picture of it? You become kind of wrapped up in it. Uh, I have been fortunate or unfortunate, however you look at it, to happen to catch these things with my camera. Uh, there's some type of flying creature. 
Uh, I'm not positive of their exact size. Sometimes they appear to be very small insect size, and sometimes they appear to be very large in the four to five foot range, at least the ones I've seen and caught on, on tape. Um, when I first looked at this, I thought, well, what a joke, you know, this is going to be. But when I saw my own video that I shot and saw this thing fly uh, slow motion through the camera, I thought, okay, what the heck's going on here? It, it, was, it was a little startling about what have I caught. I felt a little special because I am a very incredibly logical individual, and unless something has irrefutable evidence, I, per, I tend not to believe it. What I do know is it's unlike any other creature that I know of on this planet. Suddenly, we have in front of us just all of this continual footage with everything that we have described in the past. Not only did I find what I perceive as a better shot of a rod flying by the camera, I saw dozens of rods zipping around down in the cave. Jim and I are beside ourselves because now we have an overabundance of rods. You don't know how pumped when I first sat down <laughs> and, and we just sat there just in awe over what we were seeing. The unique thing about this, you know, all these base jumpers go into the base of the cavern, they land and they get pulled up by a rope. And there's a shot that is just watching these guys being hoisted up, up this rope. Uh -huh. And the rods are swarming around them. How many? I mean, that's just Hard it. Hard to count. You, you, I mean, you, you, that's just it. You know, we were sitting there, and they're swarming around. And, we're going, and that's when we're going, like, are we misidentifying this? Are they insects? Are they this? Are they that? You know, and we're stopping, and we've got them just buzzing by the climbers as they're coming up. You know, we've, we've got them coming by the camera. We've got birds in the shots. We've got bugs in the shots. Like I said, that is the thing about this video. It has it all at the same time. Even Mark, you know, in his incredulous attitude, you know, at the beginning about this, mm -hmm. I was there and I, you know, mm -hmm. I taped it and I didn't see anything else. That's just it. That's the part of the phenomena. Is they are so fleeting, is, is that you just don't pay attention to them. Also on another adventure uh, base expedition in Norway, I, um, I was doing some video editing. This is months after the Mexico trip. 
Uh, I've watched that video and showed friends the uh, the rods video that uh, I shot in in the cave in Mexico, and everybody's astounded. Nobody knows what to make of this thing, and uh, I, it was pretty much out of my head. I'm, I'm now in Norway shooting some more uh, video of base jumping off 3,000 foot walls over the fjords. Um, while doing some editing, I was queuing my my uh, equipment up frame by frame and I, I was blown away. I had literally caught another rod in another part of the world in a whole different situation screaming across the uh, in front of my camera while shooting base jumping. This is a discovery of major significance. Uh, it's hard to underestimate something like this. The big questions remain, uh, what are they? Are they alive? Are they hardware? Where do they come from? Do they live in the cave? Boy, a million questions. We know that we've got to go further, you know, to really pinpoint what these things are. How far away are they actually from the camera? The distance and the speed, we occasionally have, you know, points of reference where they fly behind a bush or something like that you know, to give us an idea. I'm excited. I mean, it's like finding a dinosaur living in the middle of Africa. Exactly. Anyone that sees this, they're going to say, okay, that's an insect, that's a bird, that is something else. 